the average toilet paper roll requires 37 gallons of water just to press down one single roll. And the average American uses an average of 57 sheets of toilet paper per day or a roll and a half of toilet paper per week. Hi, everyone. Just wanted to let you know that this episode contains some colorful language. So if you're listening with kids, you might want to save this episode for later. Welcome to the Doctor's Pharmacy. I'm Dr. Mark Hyman, and that's pharmacy with an F, F A R M A C Y, a place for conversations that matter. And today's conversation should matter to you because it's about doing things that make the world better in a way that's pretty disruptive and fun and crazy. And we're having an extraordinary guest who can teach you a little bit about how to think differently, change the world, and have an amazing time at the same time. So, this is a great conversation. It's with my friend, uh, an extraordinary entrepreneur, and broad thinker and disrupt her, Mickey Agrawal. Uh, welcome, Mickey. Thank you. So happy to be here with you. Yes. And so she's the founder of several acclaimed social enterprises called Wild, which is an incredible restaurant, which is gluten-free pizza and healthy food and all kinds of great stuff. A Thinks, which is an underwear company, actually not just any underwear company, but a period free underwear, which is basically underwear you wear that wicks all the menstrual blood away and allows little girls to go to school in developing countries where otherwise they would have to stay home and not get education. We can talk about that. Another incredible company called Tushy, which sounds a little strange, but we're going to talk a lot about Tushy today, which are all valued at over $200 million. She's also got another company and another company coming, so you're going to hear a lot about those. One of them is a pretty extraordinary about how to save the world with diapers, so we're going to get into that. She's also the author of the number one best-selling book, Do Cool It, and disrupt her and she's also was named fast company's most creative people young global leader by the world economic forum and inc's most impressive women entrepreneurs which i agree she's very impressive Uh, she speaks passionately about her 16 years of entrepreneurial adventures from inventing products and taboo categories to creatively launching them to marketing and scaling them exponentially to dealing with really bad setbacks. not It's not all an easy, straightforward ride for most of us who are doing good things in the world. And she shares her colorful, authentic revelations revelations all on the way. Now, when I think of Mickey, I think of two quotes. The first is uh, a Chinese proverb that says, people who say it can't be done should not interrupt those who are doing it. (laughs) (laughs) That is certainly describes Mickey. And the second is a Bertrand Russell quote, which says, the reasonable man slash woman, that was back in the days when it was man, but anyway, it's all, you know, uh, adapts himself or herself to the world. And the unreasonable one persists in trying to adapt the world to him or herself. Therefore, all progress depends on the unreasonable man or woman. (laughs) So, So those are the quotes that I think of when I think of Mickey. So welcome. Oh my goodness. Thank you. I love you. So you're a repeat guest, which is very rare. And the reason I'm having you on is not just because you're one of my best friends, uh, but because you're one of the people who inspire me the most about how to be in the world in a way that's creative, playful, intelligent, disruptive, and makes the world a better place in the midst of all of it. And that is a rare combination of features. And plus, you went to Cornell with me, so that's also a bonus. (laughs) Yes. Go Big Red. Yeah. So... um, We're going to talk about your companies, but I I want to sort of talk about what shaped you. How did you get to be this human that thinks differently, that sees problems, but actually doesn't see the problem, sees the solution and how to get there, and then not only sees it, but is able to build companies that quickly scale and end up solving really difficult problems in ways that nobody's thought about? How did you get to be this incredible human? (laughs) Oh, um, I, would I know say, that wasn't I mean, on the questions you got submitted. I, <laughs> I know. I love it. I love it. I, um, I, I, I would say that, you know, I grew up in Montreal, Canada. Um, you know, I'm, my mother's Japanese, my father's from India. And we just grew up in a very unorthodox household where, you know, whenever there was a problem in the world, my parents, you know, my father came to America with $5 in his pocket. My mom came here from Japan speaking barely any English. And, um, and anytime there was a problem, they took it upon themselves to solve it. You know, for example, you know, growing up, there wasn't any gifted children summer camp. And um, they were, you know, there was sports camp, there was day camps, so there, was, there wasn't any gifted children summer camp. And so they decided to take it upon themselves to create the first one in Montreal. And all of a sudden, 500 children 
you know, came every single summer and it became a thing that ran for 15 years. And so it was a really powerful just showing that you don't have to have any resources. You don't have to have any money. You don't have to have any connections, nothing. If you see a problem, you can solve it, you know? So, and so, so I think- you, you and your sisters with a problem and they solved it by creating... <laughs> <laughs> a, gifted, a gifted kids camp. That is awesome. Yeah, and things like that. Anytime they would, anytime they would see um, a problem, like you know, growing up, electronics in the '80s, you know, were starting to kind of percolate. My, you know, my parents were like, "Oh, electronics are the future. Children should know about electronics." So they created this. You know, there was there's nothing that taught kids about electronics, and so they created this electronics kit called called Tomorrow's Professionals that basically taught kids about how to a transistor, resistor, diodes, you know, switches breadboards, how to put it all together, how to create little, little, you know, electronic systems like burglar alarms. And they, they, my mom wrote the manual and drew the pictures. My dad made the kit and they sold it all over Canada. And so it was just a a beautiful observation. They never kind of, you know, threw it down our our throats, but they, they just solved problems without any, without any resources available to them. Um, And that was really powerful to watch for when I became an entrepreneur down the road and started companies. It was like, oh, I can apply the same type of like energy to something. I just, if I want it so badly enough, it could, it could be in the world. That's amazing. And you'd literally put it all together in ways that are, are pretty disruptive. And the, 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 the first company you did was a restaurant company and you, you, uh, you had your ups and downs with that, but it's still going on. It's wild. It's in New York city. I don't know how it's stri- striving uh, or thriving or surviving within this crazy COVID-19 era, but um, that, that is, that is a, a, an extraordinary fun adventure that taught you a lot about being an entrepreneur, right? Ups and downs. Oh my God. I would say the restaurant business taught me, first of all, deep work ethic, seven days a week, you know, 12 to 14 hours every single day, nonstop, pretty thankless overall. Um, but I think um, it, also, it also taught me that my strength necessarily isn't operations, but it's really in the creative vision. It's really in the marketing, it's really in, you know, coming up with the actual, you know, concepts for it, but then having a great operational team to execute on it. So I learned a lot from, from, from being a restaurateur in my first, uh, as my first career. And and then you started this company, Thanks, because uh, you and your sister were semi-professional soccer players. (laughs) Yeah. Went to South Africa and saw what was going on with the girls here. And that inspired you to think about this problem. So tell us a little bit about that experience and, how that shaped your thinking and helped you start this company and what it is. Yeah. I mean, so I, I just think that first of all, you know, when I was in the restaurant business, I would run from one restaurant to another. So I opened my second restaurant. It was so exciting. And I would ride my bicycle from the Upper East Side location to the West West <laughs> location. And it was such a moment. I had a, an imprinting moment where I was you know, riding my bicycle down the West Side Highway and the sun was setting and it was spring and it was beautiful. And I was just like, wow, you know, like we can really invent our own reality if we so choose, you know, and going from one restaurant to another and building it out was such a beautiful imprinting moment. But, you know, oftentimes when I run from one restaurant to another, I would completely forget that I, you know, if I had my period, I would just have these crazy accidents all the time and it would just leak through everything and it would just interrupt my day. I'd have to run home and change and clean everything. And I was just a very irresponsible bleeder, you know. And you like to wear white. (laughs) And I love wearing white. Oh my goodness. Yeah. And then of course, in the developing world, you know, my father's from India, my mother's from Japan, and I traveled around the world you know, and, and on my trips discovered that there are millions and millions of girls, half a billion girls that don't go to school because of their periods. And millions of those girls drop out of school because of their periods because you get so behind. Imagine missing one week of school every single month because of your period. I mean, it's so hard to keep up. And so a lot of those girls drop out and they just lose the opportunity. And there's this great, amazing study called The Girl Effect by that Nike put together, which basically says that you know, they, they studied, you know, if, if there's a man and a woman who are both working people, they learned that 90% of women's <clears throat> money that they earn goes back into their family and their communities. Yeah. Guess how much of the man's money goes back in the family and the communities? 10%? Yeah, like 10 to 15%. And the rest he squanders on himself, alcohol, gambling, whatever, but just on himself. And so the idea is that if it's a working woman that's actually contributing to a, a, a village that needs to be uplifted – they are, they per, they 90% of their money goes into uplifting the, the community. So it's, so if millions of those girls are dropping out of school, that's billions of dollars of lost income potential that these communities could be receiving 
you know, from these women. So, and, and that's not only, that's not the only thing. I mean, a project drawdown, which lists the top solutions to draw down carbon from the environment lists education of women as one of the top solutions to climate change. Yes. So not only are you creating economic vitality by helping solve this problem, but you're helping solve climate change by dealing with women's periods and education. <laughs> It's just, there's just a, there's a mothering, right? There's like women are just mothers and, and, you know, mother earth. And there's just, there's a stewardship that a nurturing stewardship that's just innate, you know? And, um, and I think that, yeah, it's, it's a, it's a huge thing. So when I started things, you know, with my co-founders, um, it, w- it became, you know, an absolute resolve to, you know, to, to, to weave the two businesses together, you know, to, to, to create an underwear that supports women here in the first world and then also solve a problem for girls in the developing world. And, and you, you hit a lot of resistance with this because, you know, no one wants to talk about women's menstruation or periods. It's a pretty taboo subject. And uh, tell us about the, uh, the adventure with the New York public transit and subway system because uh, that was quite a story. And uh, they had these big ads for breast reconstruction and all these things in the subways and I travel throughout the New York subways and they really didn't want to talk about your periods and show grapefruit. Can you talk, can you talk about that and how yeah. you overcame that? Absolutely. So when we were, you know, finally getting past the digital marketing phase and wanted to actually go, you know, do some, you know, subway campaigns, we had enough money to do that. Um, you know, we, we submitted a proposal to the New York, to the New York public transit system that just said, you know, underwear for women with periods. And it was a woman, it was a grapefruit as our sort of image, um, halved grapefruit. And, um, the, they basically- How risque. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, exactly. It was a grapefruit, but they were like, it looks like a vagina. And we were like, well, that's up for interpretation, right? Um, <laughs> and, um, and they banned our subway ads. They said, you know, what if nine-year-old boys sees, sees these ads? Um, and we said, wow, in the most progressive city like New York City, you know, how is it possible that something as natural as a woman's period that creates all human life without that blood, no human being would be here. Um, it's not supposed to be taboo. I mean, the fact, and if anybody listening finds this, this subject to be uncomfortable, it's a really, it's a really interesting subject to lean into because, you know, it's to ask ourselves, like, why has society put such shame on something that creates human life? I mean, that's, that's, that's in the womb. That's the nutrients that, that fed all of us to, to be here on earth. So um, it, it became a, a big story. So we said, okay, if you don't pub- if you don't put our ads in the subway, we're going to go to press. And, and, and we went to press and the story. The New York Times started, loved that, right? <laughs> oh my God. The story went viral internationally and it put us on the map. And fast forward to my current company, Tushy, which we'll, we'll talk about in a second. But we, you know, when we tried to run our ads for Tushy um, in the subways, they banned our ads again, saying that bidets are sexual products which was crazy. And so we went, we said, okay, we're going to run the same type of campaign and see if it works. And we basically went to press again and the story again took off. And Michael Che from Saturday Night Live ran a three minute rant on why the New York City should have kept our tushy ads on the subways. And so (laughs) it was a a fascinating study. Incredible. So fast forward, um, you know, Finks was, you know, it's an incredible company doing great things. And, um, you know, being a woman uh, entrepreneur is not easy um, yeah. because you're often in a man's world Correct. and you were dealing with men from Southeast Asia who notoriously are not the most uh, forward thinking when it comes to women's rights and women's place in the world. Mm-hmm. And, um, and you experienced a real setback and how did that affect you and how then did you come out of that? Yeah. I mean, you know, I think what I learned was a couple of things, you know, one, um, don't give away control too early of your business, um, you know, or give a big chunk away. And at the time, you know, we really needed the money and, um, you know, so, so that was a one, one big thing. But I think for me, you know, I think it's just like finding that, 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 that spine within ourselves. Like for me, I had to really go in and say like, wow, you know, there's some crazy shit that went down. Um, you know, when money came into play and when, you know, when, when power came into play and, you know, I, I had to restructure the business and the company and it was a really, really challenging time, you know, when, when, you know, people react in a, in a really challenging way when sometimes you have to let them go. I, I didn't protect myself enough. And so there was a lot of, 
learning that happened from that experience, you know, how to, um, to really protect myself better and then how to also hire really effectively and, and how to take my time hiring. Um, so fast forward to Tushy. I mean, it took, you know, I, 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 it took me seven months to hire my CEO and like, so I probably went the other direction, but you know, when sometimes like in business, when you scale really, really fast and you're just like, Oh my God, hanging on for dear life, you sometimes have to hire a bunch of people. And so I think one of my big mistakes was I appointed, you know, one person to hire 10 people. And I kind of, it was very shoot from the hip as our coach mm-hmm. would say, you know, and it wasn't a thoughtful process. And uh-huh. so when I had to kind of look at my, at my company and say, Whoa, this is not the culture or the, the business that I, that I want to build. Um, I kind of had to restructure the business. And in that restructuring, there was a lot of, um, angst that, that came from that. So I think from, uh, that experience was just like, okay, you know, hire slow, you know, fire fast, hiring people is like a marriage. And so I learned that the really, that, you know, it was an important but, lesson to learn. Yeah. I mean, so, so often what seems like horrible things that happen to us often yeah. turn out to be the best things. And, uh, yeah. if that hadn't happened, you wouldn't have been free to do what you're doing now. Correct. And, and I think for me, I think the other thing, you know, for me is that like, you know, when you're, when you're a hard charging entrepreneur, try, when I was a hard charging entrepreneur trying to live in a man's world, you know, I had to like keep up, you know, keep up in that sort of that tone and, um, and just be sort of tough. And, um, and what I learned from that experience was, you know, like I can, I can be, I can be a softer, you know, gentler human and not have to compete and, you know, for respect in a man's word, like a man, but I can just be myself. And if people want to say, oh, she's soft, or then, you know, turn around and she's, she's, <clears throat> if she's too tough and she's soft, if she, you know, just kind of eliminate all that noise because it's so much whiplash. It's like, you're not, yeah. this, you're too fat, you're too thin, you're, you're, your butt's <laughs> too big, your butt's too small, your boobs are too big, your boobs are too small. I mean, it's, it's like, it's you know, you're too, you're too intense, you're not intense enough. Like, it's just, it's yeah. just all the things. And so, to really wipe out that noise and just ask myself, like, what kind of leader do I want to be? Like, what kind of human do I want to be? You know, like, what what is fully integrous with myself? And to ask myself those questions and sit with that and write out what those are, you know, was really important to me for my next company to just sort yeah. of, what kind of structure do I want to create for my business? That was so important. beautiful. Hi, everyone. Hope you're enjoying the episode. Before we continue, we have a quick message from Dr. Mark Hyman about his new company, Pharmacy, and their first product, The 10 Day Reset. Hey, it's Dr. Hyman. Do you have FLC? What's FLC? It's when you feel like crap. It's a problem that so many people suffer from and often have no idea that it's not normal or that you can fix it. I mean, you know the feeling. It's when you're super sluggish, your digestion's off, you can't think clearly, or you have brain fog, or you just feel run down. Can you relate? I know most people can. But the real question is what the heck do we do about it? Well, I hate to break the news, but there's no magic bullet. FLC isn't caused by one single thing, so there's not one single solution. However, there is a systems-based approach, a way to tackle the multiple root factors that contribute to FLC, and I call that system the 10-Day Reset. The 10-Day Reset combines food, key lifestyle habits, and targeted supplements to address FLC straight on. It's a protocol that I've used with thousands of my community members to help them get their health back on track. It's not a magic bullet. It's not a quick fix. It's a system that works. If you want to learn more and get your health back on track, click on the button below or visit getpharmacy.com. That's getpharmacy with an F, F F-A-R-M-A-C-Y.com. Now back to this week's episode. All right. So let's talk about your next adventure uh, called Tushy. (laughs) <laughs> which yes. is a provocative name uh, and, uh, and, and it's a company that um, seems a little bizarre, but actually solves a big problem both for the environment and for our health. So what inspired you to think about creating Tushy, and, which is a little attachment that goes on your toilet called a bidet, which most people don't know what that is. It's kind of French. And I remember growing up in Toronto and in my parents' bathroom, there was a bidet. So it was like, oh, this is what you do after you go to the bathroom. You sit on this thing and turn the water on. They have it all over Europe. Uh, I've traveled all throughout the uh, the world. And, and in most parts of the world, toilet paper is just not a thing. Uh, and uh, they use water. And they yes. have a little hose in the bathroom. You spray yourself. And so sort of that's it. And and I remember it was in Bali and I went to the bathroom at this gas station and I, it was this giant tub of water and this little bucket. And I'm like, I think I think they need your little tushy thing because this is really awkward and I don't know how to do this. And <laughs> where's the toilet paper? <laughs> so I think it's, it's just a brilliant idea. What, what kind of made you start to think about this? 
Well, I'm so I'm half Japanese, half Indian, and both cultures grew up with bidets. In Japan, there are those fancy toilets that when you walk by, it like sings to you, and it it's so expensive and thousands of dollars plus plumbing plus electrical. So it, in Japan, it's like pretty it's pretty much ubiquitous in every household. Yeah, and you walk in, the seat goes up, the, the toilet paper the toilet to you, it yeah. warms up, the seat is so warm. <laughs> it's like it's a whole experience, and it's magnificent. Wash the front, wash the back. It's yeah, like, yeah, and in India, they have those like you said, the buckets with the spray guns. You know, where you even don't even even have a spray gun you just kind of throw water in your butt you know <laughs> and a wall with a water bottle that you just spray and so I really knew about bidets growing up and I've, I've had an obsession with it and you know in 2013 for me personally you know I had a very intense hyperthyroid condition which you know where which is when you became my doctor um it was 2013-2014 when I really started seeking your help and support um and um that hyperthyroid condition was so acute that my endocrinologist, you know, well, that, that it made me poop up to eight times per day. Like I was no. pooping up to eight times per day because it was just, it was my, my body was just working in overdrive. Yeah. And um, because of that, my, just my, like wiping my butt became such a painful experience because you're going to the bathroom so much and you're wiping and wiping. And so eventually I had to go in the shower and it was just such a frustrating experience that for Valentine's Day, my boyfriend, now husband, Andrew, got me this like crappy Chinese bidet product, you know? And I was like, <laughs> what's this? And he attached it to the toilet. I was like, what's this? And it completely changed my life. And I was like, oh my God. It was like this ding, ding, ding moment where I was like, I am going to create the best in class version of the bidet attachment and bring it to America because every single American human needs to try this. Everybody in the world needs to have one of these. And what I, what we created is a modern bidet called Tushy, which looks like a beautiful iPhone next to your toilet. You have a couple in your house. You get it. Three. <laughs> Three. Yes. And, and it basically clips onto your existing toilet in 10 minutes, turns any toilet into a bidet and it just, it saves 50 million trees from getting flushed down the toilet. It saves our health and hygiene for anybody who's like, you know, cost conscious. It's just like the average family spends $500 a year on toilet paper. And that's like, that adds up really fast. And so, you know, from a cost savings, from a hygiene and health perspective, I mean, UTIs, hemorrhoids, anal fissures, anal itching, bacterial vaginosis. I mean, you name every ailment down there by just get, washing it properly with water is like a duh solution. I mean, the, the analogy I always give is, imagine yeah. if you jumped in your shower, didn't turn the water on, and just used dry toilet paper to wipe down your dirtiest bits. I mean, people would call <laughs> you crazy, right? So like, why are we doing that to the dirtiest parts of our body? We would never just use dry toilet paper to clean any other thing in our lives and call it clean. And so yeah. it's been such deep indoctrination, which is why I'm so excited about you know, the idea of a disruption and disruptive innovation is because we've been indoctrinated to believe things to be true, but they're just illusions. And so if we can just wake up to like, oh, wait, let me wash instead of wipe. Like it was just, it was, it, you know, it was just an obvious thing. So, so it's, it's sort of good for your health. Yes. It's good for your wallet. Yes. And it's good for the climate because you're not cutting down all these trees. Yes. It's, just <laughs> it's a triple threat. <laughs> It's just so obvious, right? It just people don't know about it. And people find it to be weird. They're like, is poop going to spray everywhere? And the answer is no. It pulls it down like super precisely into the toilet bowl. People around the world have been doing this for so long. You know, the other question is like, is it pulling water from the toilet bowl or the toilet tank? The answer is no. It's coming from the wall, the same water you brush your teeth with. So all these things, people just, you know, are afraid of it. Well, speaking of water, I mean, we – we use a ton of water to actually make toilet paper, right? Yes. So not only are we affecting trees, but we're affecting our scarce water resources. I mean, only about 5% of the world's water is fresh water. 1% of that is in Lake Baikal controlled by Putin. <laughs> At least 4% for the rest of us. And uh, we are using a ton of it for growing Anim food for animals through industrial agriculture, which I've talked a lot about. Uh, and, and water scarcity is a big deal. There's a half a billion people every year that suffer all year long from water scarcity. And there's 2 billion people that suffer periodically throughout the year from water scarcity. Recently, Cape Town, which is a modern industrial Western city in South Africa, almost had a complete shutdown because they almost ran out of water and literally they saved the last minute by some rain. But they, they were literally on water rationing. California had a massive drought. 
So we're seeing real water scarcity issues. How does this help solve that problem? Well, so the average toilet paper roll requires 37 gallons of water just to press down one single roll. And the average American uses an average of 57 sheets of toilet paper per day or a roll and a half of toilet paper per week. I mean, it is an unbelievable amount of toilet yeah, paper. Some, someone in my family uses probably three times that. He just like, likes to use He's a lot. He's wiping and wiping and wiping <laughs> and wiping. And by the way, wet wipes actually cause anal fissures because it strips away the natural oils from your behind. And so by stripping away the natural oils over time, it breaks down your skin and causes lead lacerations. And so, you know, we've had so many customers who've had anal fissures, anal fissure operations, and they were like, Tushy has saved my life and there's no more pain that they're gone and it's it's over so so basically so you're using you know 37 gallons of water to press down one one toilet paper roll versus one single pint of water every time you use tushy and so net net you're actually saving 55 gallons of water per week by using water to properly clean yourself. One pint, man, you must leave your tushy on a long time. I don't, I don't leave mine on. <laughs> I, well, one pint is not even that much. It's like a beer, right? That's two cups. It's not that, bad, you know? Yeah. But, that, but, but I think, you know, I use less than that. <laughs> Probably less. And then you use a couple of squares to pat dry. So use 80% less toilet paper. We have organic bamboo toilet paper. So rather than killing this big, tr- like this beautiful hundred year old tree, mm-hmm. you know, you, we sent you some beautiful soft bamboo tissue. It feels like, the same or softer even. Yeah. And you also have the bamboo cloths, which are reusable. So you yes. can have a little. We have bamboo butt there. towels in Italy. They don't use toilet paper at all. They use butt towels. And so you yeah. just have your towel for a couple of days or a day, if you, whatever you want to use it. So you're taking a mini shower and you just pat dry. And so you only have toilet paper for your guests or whatever. And then you just have a couple of squares to pat dry instead of using 50, you know, like 57 sheets of toilet paper per day. So it's, it's just an obvious solution. It's obvious. I, mean, I remember living in China, <laughs> and it was quite a scene there. Uh, they didn't have toilet paper, uh, but what they did have was the People's Daily, which was used as toilet paper. So if you ever tried to wipe your butt with a newspaper, it's not, <laughs> not that fun. No. But it's probably, it's probably a good use of that. Uh, <laughs> of Americans, that, you know, Americans propaganda did that. Machine. Americans did that too. Americans used news, uh, news, used um, phone books pages when they were free as a, as a wiping tool. Phone book pages. Yeah. I mean, how did how, who invented toilet paper? How did that even come to be? Well, so in the eighteen the late eighteen hundreds, the Scots brothers and Charmin were sort of like the first ones to popularize. Oh, Mr. Charmin. And the Scots brothers, you know, Scots paper. Yeah, and yeah. they're the ones that they were like, hmm, like what can we what do humans do every single day? Oh, poop. Okay, what can we market to the American consumer that just makes them use something over and over again? They call it they call it consumables, right? And so they can mm. consume it over and over again and not considering the damage to the planet, the water damage, how much bleach goes into the processes to make the toilet paper and then to bring, the, use the, the petrol to bring it to a store, packaging with plastic, shipping it to a customer. I mean, that whole system is just so resource heavy. And it just back in the 1800s, like they weren't thinking about that. They were just thinking about making money and how to create mm. sort of resources and, and build a, a, a huge, huge business. And now it's like, whoa, the ramification, the damages are, are, are really severe. So Yeah, we even have a term for that. It's called CPG, right? Consumer yeah. Packaged Goods. Good. Right? <laughs> and, yes. and, and what did Thomas Jefferson and George Washington use to wipe their butt? Oh my God. That's <laughs> I mean, what did they good, do back? What did probably they use cloths, back then? Probably cloths, like yeah. clean cloths that they would just use. And they probably had people cleaning them over, over time. Cloth, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it's pretty crazy. I think but that. Do you, do, you, uh, do you know why Americans have not adopted the bidet? No, because it's French and uh, we were against everything French. Because That was one of the first reasons. Yeah. Okay, so the second reason is during World War II, when oh. American soldiers went to Europe and fought in World War II the American soldiers would go to French brothels in France mm. and they would see oh. bidets in French brothels and they associate bidets as something sexual. So when they came back to America, to puritanical America, they were just like, oh, we were never in brothels. We, uh, we think bidets are disgusting. So they actually imported pizza because they went to Southern Italy and, and discovered Southern man's poor food called pizza. So they brought pizza, Pizza Hut Domino's came right after World War II. All those companies ballooned after that, um, yeah. but then they shunned the bidet. So it was a really mm-hmm. fascinating historical study, yeah. So we got pizza, which makes us sick, and we didn't get bidets, which make us healthy. That seemed yeah. like a dumb <laughs> idea. <laughs> right? <laughs> so um, th- this whole idea of, of bamboo is interesting too, right? Because you're using uh, renewable, quickly yes. growing, product 
that can be turned into towels or paper products, right? Yes. Bamboo grows up to 39 inches per day. You know, it takes a, it takes a bit of time for, for it to kind of, you know, you know, percolate in the soil. But then when it's like breaks through, it grows 39 inches per day. And it's like, it's the most, you know, it's like a weed. So instead of it being like a tree, it's like a weed. And so because of that, it's a much more sustainable product to use in killing this beautiful tree that sucks in the oxygen, you know, sucks in the CO2, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, like, you know, all the nitrogen dioxide. I mean, trees are the most, you know, brilliant technology that, that we just literally cut down and wipe our butts with. I mean, how disrespectful could we be of of the most important thing that gives us life, that gives us oxygen. So, so true. You know, I, I was a little, honestly, a little skeptical when you started Toshi. I was like, <laughs> mm, this is a little weird. And uh, I mean, how is this little attachment that doesn't cost very much going to actually be like a real bidet and is going to create a mess and like, what's, how's this going to work? And I'm like, you sent it to me and I put it on the toilet. Actually, my wife did because she's better at handy things than I am. <laughs> and I'm like, wow, this is so easy. It's so simple. It's so clean. It's like, how could I have even doubted you? And then, and then, and then you sent me this toilet paper. I'm like, all right, this is going to be like bamboo toilet paper. It's going to be like sandpaper. It's going to be good, good for the earth, but bad for you. And I'm like, wow, this stuff is so soft. And it comes in this beautiful packaging. <laughs> I'm like, this is so great. Like open and a I, present. Yeah, it's like great. And so I was like, wow, and I don't feel guilty about using up all this water and using up all this trees. And, you know, it's probably not good when you flush down the toilet either, right? It probably goes into what happens to the toilet paper, actually. It goes to the pipes and it goes to the system and it's processed in a plant. And it's a very, very, you know, challenging. I mean, New York City, we met with the New York State Department of Sanitation and they were just like, how can we support you? I mean, bidets, literally if every New York City household had bidets, it would save them from getting these fatbergs. Fatbergs in New York City is basically when wet wipes and toilet paper and, you know, and food particles, the oils and all the disgusting things in food all clump up together and create these like multi-thousand tons of, of cloggings in these huge New York City pipes. And, um, and it costs millions of dollars of our taxpayer dollars to go for, for people to go into those things and, and clean out the most disgusting <laughs> sludge. And so if, 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 if we just simply use bidets and just flush out the system, you're using less water, less paper, less everything. It's just mm. re resource related for the cities. It just creates a, a bigger breath of like a sigh of relief for cities to just not have to deal with the processing of so much shit and, and like, and toilet paper. Literally. You know, so it's literally. <laughs> like literally. <yeah. laughs> so Mickey, what, what are some of the biggest myths? We've talked a little bit about it, but uh, tell us some more. What are the myths that we have about bidets? What are the obstacles that you have to get over in people's minds? Because for me, even me, who, you know, is pretty open to this stuff, it was, it, it was a bit of a, a hurdle to get over the idea of actually wanting to get one of these things. So yeah. how do we help people understand what are the myths and how do we break through those? I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's actually funny because we have um, our little, we have a book that we're, that, that's coming out. <laughs> it's called, this number it's two shall pass. pass. And this is going to go in every single one of our, our tushy boxes. And we actually have a chapter, which is called um, the myth, the, the truth or derriere, bidet myth debunked. And so actually it's so. Truth or derriere. Truth <laughs> or derriere, bidet myth debunked. <laughs> And so like, okay, so the first myth is like, is it dirty toilet water you spraying your butt with? And the answer is, of course not. It's not dirty toilet water. It's literally the same water you brush your teeth with. It's pulling from the wall. So our product actually comes with a little splitter and a hose that pulls the water right from the wall, from the splitter. So it's like, that's the first bidet myth. The second one is, hmm, using a bidet seems a waste of water to me. Actually, like we talked about that already, it's like 55 gallons of water, net, net, you're actually saving water. Myth number three, toilet paper clean just as well. Um, I splurge on the extra soft stuff and it says, you know, the truth is toilet paper is playing you, you know, and actually leaves germs behind. It's just, it's, it's, it's actually like, imagine like, you know, like cutting up a raw chicken in your kitchen and then like, it's got E. coli and all the bacteria and all the, whatever it, it is that, you know, and then like you take a piece of dirty, of dry toilet paper and you just wipe the plate down and put your plate away. People will be like, <laughs> um, shouldn't you like wash the chicken bacteria <laughs> off your plate. I mean, that's literally what we're doing to our butts. It's like we're wiping this bacteria and 
infection, E. coli, with dry, smearing dry paper around, like, and then sitting on that all day long. And for women, it creeps up to your vaginal canal, and that's what causes bacterial vaginosis, you know, like, you know. Um, bladder uh, infections. Bladder infections. It causes, you know, uh, like all just the infections yeah, I mean, that you get, UTIs, uh, you know, yeast infections, all those things. Yeah, I mean, as a doctor, you know, one of the main problems with women getting bladder infections is how they use toilet paper and wipe, and that, that actually introduces bacteria up into the urethra, which leads to these bladder infections. Why women get so many more bladder infections? Yeah, just like water is a universal solvent. It's not, it's not laced with any kind of chemicals or anything. We're not saying <laughs> to put, like, use soap, because you, you know, don't use soap down there because you, it, it messes your pH. You know, but just flush it out with a lot of water and you're yeah, good. Well, you know? well, that's a medical thing. You know, we, we have a saying for that in medicine. We call it the solution to pollution is dilution. <laughs> yes. Uh, thank you. Exactly. Listen, I mean, you know, and that's another myth is the days are too expensive. It's for rich people. And it's like our product is $79. I mean, it's for everyone. It, you know, it's just that's, I mean. And seventy nine dollars is one time and that's it. You buy it one time, it lasts for years versus spending hundreds of dollars every single year. I mean, you're saving thousands of dollars over the year over the course of the years. It's just so obvious. It's just people don't think about it. And so I think for us, like, you know, this whole corona thing, I mean, you know, the toilet paper shortage, yeah. the, the great toilet paper shortage of twenty twenty happened. And yeah. everyone just cleaned out all the stall, you know, all the <laughs> all the stores. Yeah. You go to Walmart, every store, there's no toilet paper. And there's like one roll or there's a box of like single rolls and it says only one per customer. <laughs> It's you know, insane. Created a mass fear and hysteria about toilet paper shortages. I don't understand that. It was crazy. And all of our customers were like, we got our tushy. We're good. And it was so interesting because, you know, we spent the last six years, you know, getting people to kind of like, you know, peer over the edge. You know, the, the analogy I always give is the Cornell analogy, our alma mater. You know, there's that big, I don't know if you ever jumped off Lover's Leap before you graduated from Cornell, but there's this big gorge that you jump off called, called Lover's Leap. And it's sort of like a bit of a rite of passage, you know, when I was there, that you have to jump off the 30 foot drop and it's so scary um, in the Cayuga Lakes. And, um, and, you know, the first, you know, the freshman year and sophomore year kind of go and you like, you get to the edge and you peer over and it's like so long. And you're just like, ah, you run away from it. And then like, by the time you're junior, by the time senior year, you're like, screw it. I'm just taking a leap and I'm going for it. The kind of same thing happened with, with, with Toshi and bidets. Like people were like, kind of getting, to, eh, should I buy one? I don't know. It feels weird. It feels, is it like awkward? It's water shooting in my butt. Like, is it, I don't know. Like, it's just weird, you know? And um, people, oh, one of the big stigmas is like, is it gay back in the day? And it's like, first of all, that's <laughs> so stupid. And it's so like, it's just, ugh, like the stigmas and the, all these old preconceived nonsense like that. Anyways, and so by the time the like, toilet paper shortage happened, like people just leapt off and, you know, we had our first million dollar day um, during mm. the toilet paper shortage. And it was like a really, really powerful showing that like people were finally ready. And then they, they, they just were like, okay, toilet paper's not available. I'm going to try Tushy and just see what happens. And like the results, I mean, the people, the feedback, I mean, people were just like, what are people what? saying? People are just like, what have I been doing my whole life? I mean, it took a pandemic for me to try this obvious solution. So it was sort of like really, I mean, New York Times wrote a headline that said like, is America ready to adopt the bidet? And it was just a really, really powerful moment for us as a company. And just for me, just to be like, wow, like people laugh for so long, you know, at this business idea and at no one's going to invest, no one's going to try it, no one's going to use it, no one's going to talk about it. And, you know, it was such a, it was such a, a moment of just, again, imprinting where it was just like, okay, like, you know, like we're on the right track and, and, um, and, and, and people's lives are better because of it. The tree that the, the earth is smiling more because so, of it. so 2020 is not only the year of COVID, it's the year of the bidet. It, it is. <laughs> Do we call it bidet 2020 instead of Biden 2020? We're like, bidet 2020. <laughs> <laughs> cut, it, cut out the end. <laughs> well, this is amazing. And you know what? What you do is not just um, solve problems, help people, reduce climate change, and create jobs. You are also giving back. Um, and for every single tushy sold, you fund a group, an organization in India that builds clean latrines for the urban poor who have access to nothing and are literally pooping out in the open in the street. So tell yeah. us a little bit about this organization and how you're helping families get access to clean sanitation. Because sanitation is a big issue in the world. A lot of people just don't yeah. have access. 
So thank you, thank you, thank you for this question because it's such an important thing for us to kind of also, and everyone listening to, to really like let that sink in. It's like we just go to the bathroom and, and we don't think about it. It's just a basic human right that we just don't think about. But you know, there are 3 billion people globally who don't have a consistent safe place to go to the bathroom. And almost a billion people practice what they call open defecation. They're just pooping outside in broad daylight. Um, and, and women, it's, it's a separate thing for women, but you know, when open defecation, the problem when people just poop outside, it gets into the water systems that people are drinking. People are drinking mm -hmm. bacteria, infection-filled you know, water, they're getting diarrhea, and a lot of these people die of diarrhea. I mean, there's half a million children under the age of five that die of diarrhea every single year. And it's just, it's, it's a really, really solvable thing. And so, um, you know, what we've done is, you know, we've, we've done a lot of research on what is the best way to attack the global sanitation crisis and to approach it. And, you know, there's a lot of nonprofits that kind of go to a village, build a toilet, and then leave. And then all of a sudden that toilet, you know, people don't know what it is, why they need it. They kind of use it a couple of times, then it becomes disgusting and dirty. And then that toilet becomes a deeper cesspool of infection. For, for people to use. And, and then now it becomes this eyesore in the village. And so what, what, the reason why we partner with this incredible organization called Samagra based in India is because what they do is it, it's a teach, a teach a man, woman to fish methodology. And I'm always in the, in the business of, you know, it, of like creating an autonomous sovereign village and a sovereign human versus a handout model. Like the, the sort of like the welfare model of just like waiting for the savior to come and save me and like give me a handout. People don't want handouts. People no, they want to feel empowered. They want to feel empowered, autonomous, sovereign in their lives. And so, you know, what Samakra does is, you know, they build, so, so they build these clean toilets in India. And then what they do is they teach the local community members what happens, they spend six months there. And, and so, and they, and they incentivize the villagers, hey, I'll give you free bar of soap if you come and use the toilet. Hey, I'll give you free minutes on your phone if you use the toilet. Hey, I'll give you all these little gifts and things that you need for your household if you use this toilet for, for the next six months. All of a sudden, the, the, the village smells less gross. All of a sudden, yeah. the water systems clean up. All of a sudden, their children are not getting sick. All of a sudden, their elderly are not getting sick. All of a sudden, they're not getting sick. All of a sudden, people are living longer. All of a sudden, they're feeling much better. And then, so, so what they do is they're teaching the local villages during this time, you know, to clean these toilets. They're actually paying a couple of villagers, you know, $2, you know, every day to clean these toilets. They hire people locally. And so then, all of a sudden, what, what they find out is, is that then by the end of the six months, these villagers are so ecstatic about all the results that happen that they didn't even know what these results would be because it was just so not used to mm. what would happen mm. that they then, um, they then, you know, like appointed, a, you know, a two people paying, you know, each family then pays about $1.25 per family per month for them to pay for someone to clean the toilets. And so it becomes an empowerment model. So then they become an autonomous village that takes care of the toilets. They hire two people to take care of the toilets. They get paid for it. And then we can move on to the next village. So not having to stay there forever, they then understand why it's important. They end up paying $1.25 per family per month, which is totally reasonable. Most of these families make between 2 and $3 per day. And so paying $1.25 per family per month is totally, totally manageable. And so we move on to the next village and create again <laughs> the same sovereign autonomous thing. And so we go from village to village and it's not, you know, it's, it's an obvious choice. And so like what I'm doing now for Tushy is I'm so, so, so excited as we finally create the Hello Tushy Foundation. And, and what I've been really in, in, like, in, inspired by and, and, and like excited about is the closed loop model, closed loop systems. And so what I'm creating for, for Tushy or for Hello Tushy Foundation is what I'm calling the Village Regeneration Starter Kit. And so the Village Regen Regeneration Starter Kit is basically, so the first thing is we're partnering with this really epic organization called Ecofiltro, which basically makes these water filter systems that can take the dirtiest, most disgusting, like putrid water and put it through this filter system. And it's $30. That's all it costs for family, $30. And it tr produces that into perfectly, absolute clean, purified drinking water. Mm -hmm. Then I do, we're partnering up, up with this toilet company called Ecozoic, which basically makes these toilets that, that, that have enzymes and microbes in them that break down the poop, the poop. Kind of like um, composting toilets. Yeah, and then turn the, per, turn the poop into fertilizer. And yeah. so, so basically the, fr the fresh, the, the, the water 
people drink the water, they're pooping not disgusting poop, they're pooping cleaner poops, they're drinking good water. They're, so then that feeds the toilets, the toilets and the fertilizer then feeds the, the little farms. So we're, gonna, we're giving each family a vertical farm, which then grows up to 12 varietals of fresh foods. And, and, and basically in eight weeks, they're going to have all this produce that grows really fast, it's nutritious. And so then the, each family gets the food that the fertilizer for their poop fertilizes the, the food the, the food and the water from the fitter filter fertilizes uh, you know waters the, the 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 food and so it's this closed loop system and then we're 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 creating these um, solar cells that basically have these fan that that can power fans because a lot of these children and elderly are dying because these huts don't have access to airflow so we mm. found these solar cells for ninety five dollars we can have these solar cells that can power these air fans. And these fans just then now save and then powered by the sun. And so it's this full on closed loop system where all they want is access to food, to clean water, to clean toilets, and to basically energy. And so this village regeneration starter kit that I'm creating is going to mm. be the foundation for the Hello Trishy Foundation. And I'm so, so, so excited great. about that. So great. So yeah. you're not only helping the people who are actually buying Tushy, but you're helping people who are struggling. And I think people should understand that you know, most of the advances in our life expectancy had nothing to do with modern medicine, like very, very little. I mean, if we eliminated heart disease completely, we'd add four years of life expectancy. However, it's the social conditions, it's the public health and sanitation issues that are often at the root. And that's really why we've seen this massive increases in life expectancy is sanitation, is toilets, is clean water. Okay. It's not having literally millions and millions of kids and people die every year from diseases that which should not kill us like diarrhea. And I've been in these countries, I've seen it and it's just, it's just heartbreaking. So I think the work you're doing both in terms of sort of dealing with the dumb idea of toilet paper and creating a better solution and addressing some of the public health issues that are keeping literally billions of people down in the world uh, is just so awesome. Thank you for that, Mickey. I mean, Thank you. And I, and I, and I think that what, what's so exciting, and I think this is why I love you so much is that like, you know, we're, we're creating a world we want to see. And I think like through business, like through business, like we can actually take the profits and take a part of the profits. You know, I believe in profit and purpose go hand in hand. I sit on the board of conscious capitalism with, you know, founders of Whole Foods Market and the founders of, you know, Grameen Bank and all these, or the president of Grameen Bank and all these really epic leaders. And, you know, it's really about conscious businesses that will save the planet and save the world and save humans. It's not necessarily for-profit companies or necessarily nonprofits. I think it's for purpose, conscious businesses that'll do that. And I think conscious businesses, if created right, can actually, like our money, can, we can create the world we want to see through, yeah. through, through the profits that we make. And, and this, is, this is actually a, a very important thing, Mickey, because you know, conscious capitalism sounds like a little bit of a fringe, radical left thing, but uh, the Business Roundtable, which is the leading businesses in the world, um, came out with a statement last year that said we need to reframe value from just being about shareholder value to stakeholder value, yes. meaning everybody who is affected all yeah. along the chain of supply and all along the course of their products, how is everything being affected? The environment, you know, people. Employees, I mean, employees customers, employees. suppliers, yeah. the planet, and shareholders. That's, that's, the, that's the basis of conscious capitalism. Um, yeah. like John, John Mackey wrote the book, Conscious Capitalism, and it's about the stakeholder model. It's yeah. a win, 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 win model. Everybody wins. And actually, conscious businesses outperform major S&P 500 indices by up to 14x. So financially, right. it's actually financially. a way better investment. To well, that's what he, businesses. right. And then, and then, then um, you know, the head of one of the largest investment companies in the world uh, who writes a letter every year uh, out to the world said, you know, hey, all you business leaders, unless you incorporate climate thinking into your business model, uh, you are going to have a problem, not just from an immoral or ecological point of view, but from an economic perspective. So I think this, this is really shifted. So you are dealing with problems you've had that you want to solve that you create incredible solutions for that not only help you, but help people, help people save money, help save climate, help solve all kinds of big issues like public health crises. And it's just so cool. I mean, I, I think it's pretty cool. I think, I don't know what you're going to come up with next, but I know it's going to be very cool. And I'm just so excited about you and the world and we need more of you. And I think people listening 
who think they can't do something or something can't be done should really take inspiration from your story because you're one of those people that never sees obstacles, only opportunities. And uh, we all get knocked down in the world and our lives and you have many times and you get right back up and you go, okay, I'm going to get back up and do the next thing. And I think uh, it's just so inspiring, Mickey. I don't know what you're coming up with next, but this is such an awesome gift. And I encourage everybody listening to check out what she's doing and Mickey's work. She's got her own website. It's uh, MickeyAgarol.com. It's M-I-K-I-A-G-R-A-W-A-L.com. You can check out HelloTushy.com. Don't go to Tushy.com. It's HelloTushy.com. It's an incredible, incredible gift. It's an incredible gift to yourself, uh, to those you love. Uh, It sounds a little weird, but uh, trust me, it is really the future. uh, And it's all what we should be having in our bathrooms. And I've got one every bathroom that I use, except when I travel around, but then I have to suffer, but it's okay. No, I have a travel petition. I think we need need tushies in every single hotel across America. That is what we should do. And I actually, I have a connection for you. (gasps) Um, (laughs) So um, there's a new tushy system that's coming out um, in September. What is that? Yes, yes. And so basically it's the future of pooping. And, you know, we have our Tushy Audubon, which is a stool where you put your feet up and it's the most beautiful aesthetic, aesthetic stool where you put your feet up to poop properly. Right now, when we take a, when you go to the bathroom and we just sit down on a chair, like it's actually kinking our colon because we're natural, the natural way to go to the bathroom is actually like crouch down. And so that's the natural human way, which unkinks your colon, all of your poop comes out. When you're just sitting on a seat, only 70% of poop comes out. And so we have the most, but then right now there's some ugly stools that exist in the market. They're just really, really eyesore. It looks like some hospital thing. So we we spent the last two years like really developing the most beautiful, looks like an art sculpture in your bathroom. So you're like the apple of like uh, personal Um, care products. Yes. And so it's this gorgeous, you know, called a tushy ottoman. And and then you of course sit in your toilet and we have our three, our tushy bidet, which you spray your butt with. We've went through every single like single aspect of the bidet to make it perfect. The way the stream comes out, the way it cleans the nozzle, the way it, like the way it, it, it supports you. We've thought through every single thing. And then we have our, our tushy tissues. So right now people like they, they kind of, you know, like, like even, even when, even when they have a bidet, like even when they have a tushy at their home, because we're so used to it and it's a role, they made it like the like Scott's brother, they thought it through, like they made it a role. So you're using way more than you need to. You're just wrapping around your hand a couple of times. Yeah, it's not like a clean you wipe. Just pull it's out not one just pull at a time. One. Exactly. And so what we're develop, what we developed is called the Tushy Tissues or the Tushy Tissue Stand, which is this beautiful stand where you, it looks like this minimalist Japanese gorgeous like aesthetic and you pull one sheet at a time, one square at a time. So it's like, it, it's, you know, but it's a reverse clean, it, but it looks this, it looks like a beautiful thing and you're saving 80% of toilet paper and you're controlling how much you use. It's hundred percent bamboo and it makes you stand for the planet. We say our tushy tissue stand helps you stand for the planet and your pocketbook in your life. So that's our, that's what's coming out next in the subscription model. And then our tushy tissue, the tushy brush. And so right now the, the biggest toilet brush in the market, this is like, I'm so excited to be talking about all these toilet products. <laughs> I'm so like, I can, I'm so like, well, they used, they used to call me it. Dr. C every poop at Canyon Ranch when I worked. I know, that's why day. I love you so much. <laughs> You're my poop doctor. You changed my life. I, mean, I just want to, you really changed my life. I mean, you saved my thyroid and have to take it out. Thanks to you. Like, you know, you, you helped me make a baby, you know, you, you like, you know, well, indirectly. Like, I, indirectly. Yeah, indirectly, <laughs> indirectly, you know, you, you really changed my life. And I love you so much much for that. I mean, like you're just, you're just the best. Anyways. So the last, the last product is, so the number one selling product right now on Amazon is this toilet brush called the wand. And it's like this plastic toxic eye, like, like eyesore that you like, because people don't want to wash, you know, scrape their toilets with poopy, like whatever, and then put their toilet brush back in the thing that collects more poop. It's just gross. And so the, 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 this, this product on Amazon, you could just like, you just press in this thing and it clips onto this plastic thing that's you clean it and then you clip and then it throws it in the garbage. Ooh. And so it's this terrible single use product. And we're just like, but people like, love it. It's number one selling product on Amazon because people don't, people don't want to have this gross thing. And so, and our use of disposables now. So what we've created is like the most environmentally friendly version of that, which is basically this bamboo um, stick that has this grabber and it pulls and and each, these, our little pads are made, are 100% upcycled coconut husks. 
Oh, and wow. um, and they're upcycled coconut husks and 100% compostable, and they're made out of 100% upcycled coconut hus- husk. And that's because coconut husks are super rough. And so you basically just squeeze it, it grabs it, it cleans the toilet, and then it's 100% compostable. Or if it goes in the garbage, it just breaks down like a, like food. So it's just like in two seconds, it's gone. So it's this the most eco-friendly version of the best-selling product on Amazon. So we're excited to go head to head against them and just prove that we can clean the toilet as good with a much more hundred percent environmentally friendly product. Yeah. You're like Thomas Edison meets <laughs> Steve Jobs meets Elon Musk. I don't know. Something like that. I mean, <laughs> You're okay. pretty amazing. Anyway, Mickey, thank you so much for being on the doctor's podcast. Everybody should get a tushy, go to hello tushy.com and learn more about it. It's pretty awesome. And if you and if you if you have any questions, you can DM me on Insta, just at Mickey Agrawal on Instagram. Yes, and she's cool. So you've been awesome listening to all this crazy stuff about taboo subjects. I hope this hasn't grossed you out too much, but I think it's important for us personally, for our health, for the planet, uh, and and to solve so many of our big global problems. I thank you for thinking out of the box, Mickey. And if you've all been listening to this podcast and you loved it, share it with your friends and family on social media, leave a comment. We'd love to hear from you and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And we'll see you next time on The Doctor's Pharmacy. Pharmacy.